So, assalamu alaikum everybody. Assalamu alaikum. Let's start the discussion. The topic of which is our equality, equality and human rights for Muslim women recognized in Finland. And today, uh, your four, uh, three participants. Uh, unfortunately, one sister could not join. Maybe she's late. But we're going to keep on going if she starts to join in. So I'm going to be a moderator, Umama Sayyid, from Simi Project and Amal Ru. Um, and let's have a brief introduction um, round. So if uh, everybody uh, would start introducing themselves uh, in alphabetical order. So Fatima. Okay. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, everybody. Yeah, I'm uh, Fatima Yusuf Beg, and I'm from Pakistan. And uh, I've been here in Finland for the last 10 years now. And um, I work here as a doctor. Is it enough or uh, yeah. should I say something else also? That's great. That's good. Yeah. So, and uh, then we have Jennifer. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, my name is Jennifer. Uh, I'm a native from Finland, uh, but lived, uh, lived abroad for some time as well. I currently work for a multicultural organization as a counselor in a women's shelter, working with victims of domestic violence and abuse. And um, 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 yeah, I think maybe that's something that I could say about myself right now. Thank you. Inshallah, that's nice. So now we have Saima Junaid. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, my name is Saima Junaid and I'm from Pakistan. And um, I've been living here since 2012. And um, I've been a stay-at-home mom and a job seeker since and now I'm doing my part-time master's in service design and leadership so yeah that's that's about it that's nice mashallah so let's get started and um, le, so we have one hour and uh, I just wanted to remind you girls that uh, uh, we should keep our answers to the point and concise so that everybody gets a chance to share what they have to for all the questions that we have planned so uh, we'll go ar around uh, for the discussion in an alphabetical order. So first we ha will have Fatma, then Jennifer, and then Saima. Okay, then we have, um, we, this, these are the names of the participants. As you can see, one of the sisters could not make it. So now we have the questions. So here we go. The first question is, uh, what does equality and human rights mean to you, um, generally speaking? So, Fatma? Okay. So, uh, I think uh, there are two questions in one question. Like, uh, what do we mean by equality? And to me, equality means that uh, there should be same opportunities for everyone without any discrimination, irrespective of the ge geographical area or the religion or the culture or the skin color. And uh, if we talk about the human rights, then I think the basic human rights should be for every human being. And uh, the basic rights are like the food, water, the roof over the head and the right to speak. And I think the education and health, they also they also belong to the basic human rights and these rights should be available to everybody okay. irrespective of the region yes yes i agree with you and jennifer what's your take on this what does equality and human rights mean to you um i kind of approach this from like a human rights perspective that the basic general approach to what the human rights are to individuals which i think i just kind of put some basic labels such as independence, uh, your own identity, justice, access to basic elements, food, water, mm -hmm. shelter, um, but then also cooperation amongst the community that we live in and freedom to our own religion and freedom to express ourselves and maintain our own dignity. And then I think I sort of think about equality as we are in we have access to, to like the same services and quantities that other people have who don't share these identities as we do as Muslim women. And the fact that we're also entitled to these things without any bias, without any conditions. 
and so I think equality and human rights, I approach it as, as you know, from, from a kind of cliche point of view that, you know, we have the right to the same things as everyone else unconditionally, the basic things that for survival and, and maintaining a healthy, a healthy, happy life psychologically, physically, mentally, emotionally, um, from a holistic perspective, so to say. Yes, yes. Well, yeah, that sums it up very nicely. And Saima? Um, to me, um, I, th- I believe that equality is something that you can grow up to be the person that you want to be uh, freely, regardless of uh, like um, age, culture, sex, gender, religion. And um, obviously, according to what the society norms are, but uh, I mean, that's for me equal- equality that, uh, you know, it's, it's giving the individuals a chance to become what they want to be. And yeah, so that's pretty much what I believe in. And your idea of human rights? Human rights, I, w- I would say that, okay, that society has uh, defined these particular rights that every individual should have. And um, we are obviously, we, we are again, social animals and we have to, go by those rules then if if those rules are set already then obviously they need to be accessible and they need to be there for everyone and not just a particular group so so universally um, universally yeah yeah, universally for everybody yeah so yeah uh, that's right like uh, universal human rights should be available to all the groups in all the countries but unfortunately that's the question that we are always debating and that's what's happening around so often that we don't get our basic human rights if we are a certain group of, group of people or gender. But I, I, I think uh, something that um, was just mentioned uh, was, was depending kind of like what the societal norms are. And I think a lot of times human rights and equality, they have a very Western philosophical background as to what is right, what is what are we entitled to? And so I think when you think of approach it sort of from an international perspective, people living in South America, in Central Africa, or even far Asia, uh, I think, you know, how have they ever had access to these elements to be able to sort of uh, understand that hey I I should have a right to these things and so when we have our sort of uh right now a Nordic perspective on what equality and human rights are I think we also have to take into consideration that you know who has access to provide information to people in societies where they don't even realize that they're being oppressed and it's sort of a radical approach to sort of wake someone up from their own own state of ignorant bliss to say, hey, did you know you're de- being deprived? But I'm not going to be able to give it to you. And so I think it's a really challenging, it's a, it's a challenging and complex question. And I, I'm really like enjoying this conversation and hearing the different perspectives because it just makes me sort of wonder that, you know, how are equal rights and human rights, is it even possible to achieve that? You know, when we have people who don't have access to clean water, Meanwhile, here in Finland, we, you know, we water our flowers, <laughs> you know what I mean? That's how much, we, there's such an abundance of it. And so, you know, is it equal? Geographically, it's not ever going to be possible to make it equal. You know, it doesn't, there's not enough af- clean water in Africa for multiple reasons, sure. But having access to those equal rights requires, you know, a shift in political things and it becomes sorry this is becoming a political conversation now but anyway I just thought it was a really interesting perspective and I just wanted to sort of bring this this idea into the conversation as well yeah so basically you said that basic Uh human rights are relative like uh, depending on the region where you're living in so if you're in Africa definitely they're much more basic so if you're in an underdeveloped country in an Asian underdeveloped country or developing countries so it means a completely different thing than when you're living in uh, developed society like unfortunately yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. yeah yes you're right I agree to that um okay so would you girls want to add something to it Saima or Fatima um not really I mean pretty much has been said from my side yeah uh-huh. that sounds okay moving on to the next question in discussion just a minute yeah 
So what are the reasons that you feel which might reduce uh, the status of equality for Muslim women in Finland? So it's a very direct question. And I'm sure like we've all been through this uh, process of uh, integration or in the process of integrating with the society uh, for our own reasons. But did you like in your own uh, experience feel something that uh, you feel that might have reduced your status of equality as a Muslim woman trying to integrate into the society. So, um, or if you haven't experienced anything like that, but if you know somebody, so, you know, if, through your um, own experiences or other people's friends and nearby. So uh, let's go with uh, Fatima. Thank you. Um, personally, I don't think that I have uh, faced um, um, a sort of discrimination uh, while uh, integrating into the society or into the system, but um, I have uh, I have an opinion because um, uh, when I look around and uh, I have so many Muslim friends, and um, what I feel that um, basically um, the, the, the it is like again I would say that it is like stereotyping or the impressions that are uh, already made um, um, the Finnish people uh, or the society generally thinks that um, there is lack of education in the Muslim women and uh, the media also portrays the Muslim women in a negative way and um, the people actually don't know uh, what Muslim women are capable of or uh, and uh, uh, like they can also be equally um, productive uh, in their society. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think it is just the stereotyping and the, in the end impression and the lack of knowledge about their capabilities. And this is the reason that um, they find it very difficult to get into the system. Yes, yes. I guess uh, I would like to add here something that in my own experience, sometimes um, people think that um, uh, maybe it's like, uh, compulsory in Pakistan, uh, as in some other countries that we have to wear a scarf, it's due to, although like I tell them like it's not a state obligatory, it's very uh, optional for us, like we have the freedom to do, to study, to drive, to do everything ourselves, but it's just the stereotype that stays if you're a Muslim woman, like that maybe you have been suppressed all yeah. your life and now you, you're like uh, free to do whatever you want to. But we uh, thank you. If uh, thank you, Mama, for a very good point. Sorry, I forgot to mention it. I, I actually uh, felt the same. Uh, like I had to clear my uh, position, my status in my society. Um, uh, being a Muslim uh, woman, living in a uh, have been like uh, raised and educated in a Muslim country, mm -hmm. and uh, the people have asked me questions like, uh, "Do you have roads in your country?" Uh, it was, uh, do you have infrastructure in the country? And how is it possible that you can be a doctor or you can be highly educated? And um, the same questions about, um, about the hijab and about the face covering. And uh, I had to answer, or I, I, I felt that I was just uh, being a representative of my country, a representative of the Muslim women. And I had cleared all their hesitations, all their questions that, that was that were arising in their minds. But um, I think, again, as many as we are in the society, we can clear their questions or their hesitations or their queries that they have. Yes, true, true. We have all been there more or less. So yeah. uh, Jennifer, would you like to add something on this? Yeah. Um, I think one of the things that impacts equality among Muslim women is the like uh, was that um, uh, Fatima had just mentioned were the stereotypes um, that exist that Muslim women are, are uneducated, incapable of professional discourse or participating in political matters. Um, I think that's one of the main things that is is hindering hindering the sort of the visual approach that what what can Muslim women do. Um, but then I do want to sort of throw, throw a, a stick into the mud here and say that we also hinder ourselves. I think something that ha I've recently sort of, of 
seen here in, in, in the Finnish Muslim women, or not Finnish Muslim women, but Muslims in Finland in general. Something that I have not yet seen in any other society is here how we sort of, many Muslim women here, they don't aspire. They sort of, uh, it's, it might be the institutional racism that limits our own belief of what we are capable of achieving. Many Muslim women here, I've heard that, you know, I can't because I wear a, 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 a long jilbab or a baya, or I wear the niqab or I wear the headscarf. I can't. Society won't allow me. So therefore, I will not try. So I think for some reason in Finland, this is a really strange phenomenon that exists, is that I'm not even going to try. I'm a Muslim woman. And so we see, I see this with a lot of um, convert Muslim women here in Finland who are native Finnish women, that once they've converted to Islam, it's sort of, okay, what kind of role can I now take on as a Muslim woman? Whereas your religious identity is your religious identity. You can be a professional ac academic scholar. You can be a homemaker. There's many things you can do as a Muslim woman, but, but I think a lot of people let that, become, it becomes a limiting factor. And so I think it's sort of something that our own insecurities that we sort of project onto our religious identity. And therefore we sort of get this unequal status in society that we've sort of created. Um, because we're living in Finland, this, country does in every way shape and form promote and encourages you know becoming educated and professional in one way or another no matter what it is that you're doing this society supports moving forward they want everyone to have access to education i'm not going to say that they don't make it that they make it easy institutional racism is a thing here too but i think also we hinder ourselves we make ourselves vulnerable um and i i hate to sort of point the finger, you know, at us, at, you know, the women who, who are, has who are struggling with this and who have experienced, um, you know, prejudice and, 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 and in different fields of their work or are struggling to integrate into the society. But I, but I do think that in general, like personally, I've, I do speak the language that has made it easy for me to integrate into this society. So that I can only speak from my perspective and say that I think the society does strive to make it so that Muslim women can be included but I think you know it's it's a two-way it's a two-way street you know I think mm -hmm. society tries to meet us halfway but are we willing to you know do the do the work to meet them there too um I I think I agree with that but I would like to add that maybe it's the fear of rejection um True. from the society due mm. to certain reasons language gender Mm. Or your background or your appearance, yeah. physical markers that might be that maybe um, after a while that it gets tedious for like mm. women to try to integrate. So they just kind of give up, although it's a process. Yeah. And I would say like I, um, I've also experienced this uh, this time of dormancy I would say that mm. when you get rejected uh, over and again that you mm. kind, kind of just want to stay in your shell but uh, i would agree that this uh, society promotes our integration as a gender and then we should keep on striving but yeah maybe everybody has their own pace you know and uh, yeah um saima would you like to add something yeah um i think that um like finland is pretty much still new to immigrants like as compared to uk like where it's normalized now. Uh, you you would see uh, uh, people wearing hijab in selfridges um, and I mean in forefront jobs and everywhere. So it's normalized there. Here it's like you still feel a bit alien. I mean even uh, a normal immigrant is uh, he feels like like an alien here, and let alone a Muslim woman. So I mean that's that's even further away and like Jennifer said I was doing this um, research on unemployment with Turku um, uh, unemployment uh, services and they were like that oh okay we do give uh, women these languages and but there are a certain group there's a certain group of uh, women that are not willing to you know do work because they say that their religion doesn't allow so so I was so yeah so the um, like you just said that we are not even we are not you know uh, ready to go uh, go uh, where 
you know, even halfway or, or let's say where we are given, we are being given a chance, but, um, but still, I would say that it's still, you know, um, kind of immigrant is a kind of an alien in Finland. And I've seen people mm. with integration courses that they know Finnish so well. I thought that Finnish was the barrier, but um, no. I mean, I've seen people with wonderful Finnish and they're still uh, looking for uh, the job in their field. So, um, yeah, I think it's uh, being an immigrant is still kind of it's, it's not being normalized yet. I don't know why it's been <laughs> so many decades, but it's not normalized. I came here personally like 10 years ago and I feel like it has uh, um, been more multicultural now and more diverse and inshallah with the passage of time I think another 10 years or 20 years we would see a different Finland but like you said like uh, it does feel sometimes alien to be walking around here even though like it's been 10 years and that's a long time and uh, and yes, I agree it's a mutual process, so we cannot just blame the society on this one. It's our own self-motivation that we should be like, um, and we should be active, motiva motivated enough to participate in this. Um, and if it's difficult for some people, well, then it is difficult for some people, but then we keep on moving at a steady pace, inshallah. But um, if I can yeah. <laughs> still one more comment, add, sorry. Yeah. Um, no, no. That I do think that another thing that does hinder this is that Muslim women in Finland are seen as a homogenic group of people. And although it can be identified that, okay, someone is Pakistani, someone is Somali, someone is West African, another one comes from France, still that label that you are a Muslim woman, I think that alone hinders, you know, the whole the, it just it defines you know are you ever going to be seen as an equal in this society because Finland from an immigration perspective is a rather young country um, where the earliest immigrants were refugees coming from Vietnam and then you know South America and then later Somalia so when it comes to this sort of free immigration and what type of immigration is the good immigration? You know, who do they want in this country and how, what kind of opportunities are provided? So, I, I mean, I do want to add that I think this society, you know, although being one of the happiest countries in the world, according to whatever statistic, you know, whose perspective, you know? So I think how, how, does, it, how does it cater to, you know, foreign women who are seeking to, you know, pursue a professional career in this in this society. So, what kind of services are provided, and are they easily accessible? So, um, I, I think there are other things that do hinder that as well. Not just our. I did want to clarify that it's not just us; it is a societal problem as well. So, yeah. uh, definitely as well. Um, I would point the language being a kind of uh, very difficult to learn. And it, it is learned in a steady, at a steady pace. So I guess that's one of the reasons that people cannot actively participate in the beginning years. Mm. So, yes. So, yes. So we move on to our third question. I really like this discussion where I'm taking your perspectives and you know, opinions on this because it's an interesting uh, topic to talk about. So the third question is, do you think it's the outward image that affects the status of equality. Outward image can be a physical marker, like the way you're dressed up, the color of your skin, gender, religion, anything. Like, do you think that affects the status of equality, even your name, if you're applying for a new job? So let's begin with Fatima. Okay. Uh, it's a, a definite yes, although it shouldn't be like this. But I think that um, the hijab or the skin color or the name uh, or the or origin country, uh, like um, the such factors, they are uh, they matter, and uh, um, it is difficult to get job in this country because they don't trust. Uh, I think the uh the level or they are simply saying that they don't trust the foreigners or mm -hmm. the muslims or 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 the females like there is a lot of um 
I have nothing else to say. Maybe mm. such factors matter. Um, do you think I would like to ask you in addition? Do you think like it's easier to be an immigrant male trying to integrate here, even if a Muslim one, uh, than a Muslim woman, like being a woman? No, I don't think there there is any difference. Okay. I work in an environment where there are uh, mostly foreigners, there are males and females. But I think when I listen to their stories, how they they just integrated into the system, it was equally different, difficult for them also. Okay. And still, the level of trust uh, about uh, I would say the customers, they can be in any field. It is low. They are like um, they are always judgmental, and they are always um, uh, sorry. My word, they are apile tava. Like they are always a uh, lot of like looking for the mistakes. Yeah. So basically, if you're a medical doctor and your clients would be trying to find a mistake somewhere, uh, they don't. Uh, uh, what I feel that in the beginning it was difficult to gain their trust. Oh. But once once they have been to to me as mm-hmm. a person, then they 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 want to be my my patients. But in the beginning, they had so many hesitations, and later on, they have expressed it also with me that what they were thinking before coming to me, and what they felt while they were uh, while I treated them, mm-hmm. and uh, um, they also give very good and positive feedback. But I, I, a lot of times I get uh, the difference uh, before meeting me, before getting in touch with me, and after that. Okay, that's good. That's a good. Jennifer, what's your take on this one? Uh, also, a definite yes. Um, our, re- our religious identity labels us. <laughs> uh, and so for someone who outwardly, um, well, okay, our, we're already labeled by our skin color, by our gender, um, by our position in society, you know, are we working? Are we unemployed? Are we in school? Are we at home? What are we doing? But then how we dress, um, we all judge, we all look, you know, is, are they wearing clean clothes? Are they wearing the same clothes? And then if we're covering ourselves, how are we covering ourselves? So even amongst Muslims, we, we look at each other, who's wearing the hijab, how are they wearing the hijab, is it the appropriate hijab, you know, so already it exists within our own community, so yes, it exists in our surrounding environment as well, Um, that labels us, but then in addition to that, the intolerance, how are we tolerating of our sisters who don't cover, so the answer is, I'm going to unfortunately say no. In the, in the Finnish society, I've heard very harsh comments of people who, from people who, who look at someone who doesn't cover. And I think, okay, wow, that's a very strong opinion to have your sisters in Islam. So if this is what it, the kind of dialogue that exists within the Muslim community, and I, and I speak mainly of like Finnish language Muslim communities. Um, I have more Finnish language, Finnish speaking Muslim friends than English speaking Muslim friends. So in these groups, there's a lot of very harsh judgments based on how a Muslim will dress. So I can only assume that these similar opinions exist in our surrounding environment. However, because non-Muslims don't understand the, 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 pro- the the reasons why we cover so to them it's just a label you're a muslim you have a certain kind of mentality a certain behavior about you that makes you the way that you are and it can be as general as they want it to be but that's how they're going to uh approach us that's how their interaction is going to begin based on how what they see on the outside with that being a muslim so if they're intolerant of that it's going to affect you know, the behavior. And I think that's going to also affect what we have access to. If you go and like Fatima said, when she has clients come to her, her reception, you know, I'm, and even me at my office, like there are things that I hear that I'm sure if I were a white, uh, non covered, you know, blonde haired, blue eyed woman or male, even at that, I would never hear these things. So it's sort of the audacity to say things to us that no one would dare say to another person. 
simply because we're a minority. We're not just any minority. We're what we're female. We we are from ethnic backgrounds, religious minority. You know, we're like triple threats out there. So you know, we're gonna we we have a lot coming our way as well when it comes to you know access to equality, just based on our physical appearance alone. Let alone you know what goes on in here. So I think uh, the answer in a nutshell is is yeah. Unfortunately, our outward image does affect the status of of our equality in in the society. I agree to that wholeheartedly. And I would like to add that uh, we do f um, find ourselves being discriminated, either it's positive or negative, because sometimes people, uh, native uh, people of the society would really want you to be included. And they would go out of their way to smile at you and to talk to you. And even oh, yeah. that's kind of like, uh, uh, sometimes that gets to you because you do know they're trying their uh, best mm. to include you but that's positively discriminating yeah, yeah. somebody like hey hi mm. because if you're in a pool which is legal to wear a burkini in a pool but you do get a lot of stares mm. if you're in a pool so it's either people who are giving you angry stares very passively or if it, it's there like uh, there are people who are just going out of their way to stop and smile at you like hey we're mm. okay with you wearing a burkini yeah, <laughs> yeah it's like legal by the state but uh, yeah. you do have to go through a see of people to be judged and mm. you know discriminated but yes i do feel that the outward image uh, uh, affects the status of our equality saima yeah um, i also believe that you know there are all these preconceived conceived um, stereotypes that uh, people uh, really act on and um, then um, like most of it has been said, but I would like to add, like when you said that outward image also includes the name. So I, I was just thinking about, you know, hijab and or our skin color and everything, but it reminded me of very interesting, um, uh, of an interesting thing that happened to me. Um, uh, in 2014, I applied for this job and um, the guy liked my portfolio and uh, uh, he said that we don't have uh, a, jo a job opening, but uh, we, we can, you know, talk about a possibility of a trainee and stuff like that. And when I went there and he was like, you know, I don't know, maybe, maybe they didn't want a trainee or anything, but, but now I can like kind of uh, relate it. And he was like, um, uh, uh, me and my, uh, where are you from? And I told him that I'm from Pakistan. And he said like me and my wife were, uh, discussing it last night uh, with your CV and uh, that uh, Saima is a very old Finnish name and maybe uh, she she like uh, her ancestors are from here or uh, like you know because my CV obviously included my education from Pakistan and so did she move there and did she move back and so I don't know if, if it had something to do with that but but it kind of yeah like reminded me of that incident and then um, outward image yeah like uh, not in work place but in um, in college I've experienced that maybe uh, I do like I've gone uh, most of the, uh, the time they end up you know at the pub even after the game nights they end up at the pub and you know they have like more uh, unified friendships and uh, yeah I don't go to the pub all the time I went there twice had a coke and I, but 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 you know these things do affect and you know, they wouldn't ask you the next time because you said no once. And yeah, so, so yeah, it does, does affect the status of equality. Um, I agree with you. I have also experienced that uh, myself in my college, like because our social life is completely different than um, this native social life. And so you get invited. I mean, I really like my non-Muslim friends. They're very supportive and uh, you do get invited but it's kind of a very like uh, difficult to say no and then you always don't want to say like because we're muslims because you know that uh, you don't want to drag your religion yet again into this so one or two times and then you stop kind of bonding with the native uh, non-muslim society yeah. even though it's nothing like harsh but just because our uh, social life is very different yeah. um yeah so uh, if I would say that I agree with uh, this very valid point by Saima and what I have also experienced the same that it is very it is difficult to get bonding mm -hmm. due to our different social mm -hmm. setup set yes and, and I think it's in, like it's unfortunate because in the Finnish society you know um, everything revolves around going to the bar yeah. everything revolves yeah. around let's go to the nightclub and so 
you want social inclusion, you know, so it's kind of like, what part of my religious identity am I willing to compromise so that I can, you know, try to find my place? And, and I don't think that's to say that anyone's compromised anything when going out with a non-Muslim friend, but, you know, it puts you in a very uncomfortable position because this society revolves around alcohol, you know, it's, it's such, it's such a strange thing, you know, there's not much to do in this country on your free time where you can mingle with your friends and go out that, you know, in a, in a halal way, you know, with your non-Muslim friends where you don't have to mention that I'm a Muslim, I don't drink, I don't eat pork, and I don't want to go to a nightclub necessarily, you know, so like, you know, without having to constantly reinforce these, these things, you know, which I think also, you know, sometimes you would, you would think most people would know that, okay, Muslims don't drink, they don't do these things. And so if I want to hang out, you know, and I'm going to invite them, you know, to be mindful of these things. And I think that just, you know, reciprocating this kind of a respect, you know, would also promote more social inclusion, you know, and I think that would mean that the, you know, Muslim population would also strive harder to, to, you know, maybe who knows what, what kind of fruitful, you know, things could come from, from this kind of a, a reciprocative relationship. But unfortunately, it's very one-sided, you know, we're expected to, you know, even leave our cultural identity to totally assimilate into a Finnish society, you know, to get that status of equality that, that we deserve. So it's, it's unfortunate, but I did want to add that in, in here. To this, this so part. more or less, we've all been through the same thing about not mm. being able to bond due to our Muslim background. Um, but yes, I guess, um, sometimes it gets like uh, you don't even want to be so open and like I said, like uh, explain everything because you get tired of explaining why you don't wear a certain dress code, why you don't shake hands or touch uh, the opposite sex. So I get, uh, I guess like we kind of just also go back to our shell and it's like, oh, we don't, we don't want to explain yet another thing. Mm. So yes, I guess the outward image does affect the status and our background. Definitely it does. Um, moving on to the last question, ladies. So, okay, how do you how do you feel the experiences of inequality for Muslim women could be improved in the future? Like, uh, do you have any concrete ideas, even like utopian ideas or anything? Like, in your opinion, like what could be done to diminish the status of inequality? Do you think that? English should be made mandatory, like so, so many people could um, at least um, integrate because of the language or what is it that you think could be done um, to improve the situation? Fatima, we would start with you. Yeah, it is always difficult to start the conversation, but I'm really glad that um, the different sisters here, they, they have so many good points and they add on to my points. Um, yes, regarding regarding how can we uh, improve the situation? I think awareness, awareness uh, amongst the society, uh, and educating the people who don't know anything about the Muslims, especially the Muslim women, and uh, uh, and I think that uh, the Muslim women should also be aware of their of their rights that uh, the Islam does not stop from being, uh, to stop from, uh, uh, from educating yourselves or to participate into the work life. Uh, and um, it is a mutual, like the motivation from the uh, Muslim women and uh, then they can, they can make a positive impact into the society. And um, I think the misconceptions, the wrong or the, the, People who know actually about the Islam and uh, the Muslim women, uh, they should come in front uh, and they should, uh, when they are available to tell the, uh, to like to uh, rule out or to the misconceptions, to clear about themselves. And the more they are integrated into the society, the more people would be familiar with them Then the, just like the other countries where there are a lot of Muslim populations and, and the people don't, they are not uh, different from others. I think it, it is a mutual, mutual uh, effort 
by the society and especially from ourselves. Yes, yes, I agree. I agree wholeheartedly with you. And Jennifer, what would you like to say about that? Um, I think I would start off with, for example, just this organization itself, Amal, um, providing a platform for Muslim women to sort of be seen, which, you know, to be seen, to be heard, to, to know that, okay, we exist, we're here um, from different walks of the earth. And so, again, I come back to this whole being a homogenous group, you know, we are a very diverse group of women. And so being able to sort of exist in this society. And so that comes back to what uh, Fatima just said, sort of, you know, educating individuals. And I think making sure that people are aware of, of you know, just the, the habits and the norms of, of Muslim individuals in general, that we pray, we have a dress code. And how can we make that, you know, incorporate that into into the healthcare field so that doctors and nurses and other staff members can wear the hijab if they want to? Are we going to upgrade the police uniform so that a Muslim woman could be a police officer? Do we have access to quiet space so that those who want to pray and not even just, it could be people who are not Muslim either, who can have access to a quiet space to meditate, pray, or, you know, somehow whatever it is that they might need where other people are taking smoke breaks or coffee breaks. And at the same time, do we really have to sacrifice our coffee breaks just because we need to pray? So how do we sort of recognize the religious, um, our, our religious needs that need to be fulfilled as a part of, you know, how can we incorporate that into our daily lives and normalize it? We don't have to hide behind a stairwell to pray and, and you know, someone's on the lookout, you know, just to make it sort of normalize it, something that happens. So we need to have, it at, you know, space available to exist. Um, but then also, I think just having services available, having access to places, you know, not just um, maybe working with families, maybe working with, you know, other professionals, you know, making sure that there's places for Muslim women to exist with their professional identity, but then it's maybe our religious identity that unites us, and that's it. So not everyone in this, in, not all Muslim women are, are, are social workers or doctors or nurses at that, you know, so there's a variety of educational backgrounds and sort of maybe making awareness of that, which I think is sort of maybe kind of on the theme of the see me, you know, as, as we are, who, who am I, you know, more than a Muslim woman, I'm not just some exotic foreign thing existing here, you know, and, and I think sort of stripping those labels from us could, could help. But I think it's through these kinds of platforms that, you know, those kinds of changes can try to try to be introduced, hopefully, inshallah. Inshallah hoping for the best for that to happen. Um, Saima, you take on I, I would say that, like you said, that it could be utopian setting. So I, I think we can apply that utopian setting that already exists in UK, US, and, uh, you know, places like uh, France. And uh, Muslim women are working uh, in forefront and, um, you know, they're, they're, they're there as a customer system, they're there as doctors, nurses, and every profession, and like, you know, they're out there. So we can maybe take uh, something from those societies, how they, they you know, actually, uh, they are there. Like Fatima and Jennifer said that, uh, you know, uh, their inclusion in the society that's very important so normalizing something it's still not being normalized uh, you know you don't see many hijabis in uh, Zara in Mango and I mean I'm talking about these professions because you know girls they can do these jobs but uh, you don't you just don't see them because this this is just not being normalized. Mm. And um, I know one person who did this, you know, whole beauty thing and she couldn't get a job uh, at um, this makeup counter thing because she, she's, she's a Pakistani and uh, she, she doesn't even wear hijab, but, but because of her skin color and everything. So, um, so first of all, they need to normalize this for, to the society that you know they need to see them more in there so that you know they, they can accept it as a part of uh, their society and then 
like uh, again, like uh, when we are talking about utopia, I think self empowerment is a very important. If there are, if there is a group of women who say that okay, we can't go out and we can't work, okay, make them you know uh, entrepreneurs. Uh, maybe uh, give them um, you know solutions like computer or maybe whatever the skill is. Maybe sewing. Maybe you know whatever. So if there is a person who's um, not really uh, who's willing to be out there that person you know they can group those two people and then uh, that person that woman who's who's willing to be out in the market can promote uh, can do the promotional side of the thing and then the other person who's a stay at home person he she can she can do the you know whatever production kind of thing so i think you know making them um, like a body system powered and entrepreneurs yeah. i think that would be nice uh, I said like a like a buddy system, but in business, yeah, buddies, yeah, 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 because definitely. you find a commonality and you combine two people. So you're yeah. not pushing the immigrant women towards cleaning sector only. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. Yeah, I guess. Um, yeah, that's. that's I, really bright if there. it's possible, I'd like to comment and sort of add on what Simon just said. Sort of the, uh, I really like the the representation. You know, how many younger generation Muslim girls are growing up without seeing themselves on TV? They're going to the clothing store Mango and they don't see any of the mannequins wearing a hijab. They're going to, you know, out the, watching TV and no commercial is there a brown skinned girl, you know, maybe a little bit more recently, <laughs> but, you know, representation do you see yourself out there you know so how do you aspire to become something if you don't see yourself you can't envision yourself in any of those environments you know there and and i think no like you said normalizing that normalizing that we're here we're headscarf no headscarf but we're here and i think on a commercial level like that's maybe it seems a little bit superficial but that's at the heart of it, because that's where that's where we look to, to to sort of, you know, on a daily basis, whether it's in a magazine, TV, clothing store, just sort of bringing that out. And then another thing that Fatima had said earlier was was trusting foreigners. And I think trusting Muslims, you know, do people trust Muslims, you know, when they're out there? You know, I like <laughs> I am not a doctor. But if I go to a doctor's office and I'm with a doctor, I don't, you know, it, to me, it makes no difference who's treating me like I'm there to get help. I am in no position to start questioning the person who's giving me a service. How dare they, you know, so sort of getting the respect and trust that is deserved. You know, we're professionals, we're educated, highly educated, you know, and if you think of the history of of Muslim scholars in general, you know, what have they produced? Mathematics, science, and all kinds of things. We don't get credit for that. So, you know, I think it's just sort of destigmatizing what it means to be a Muslim woman, you know. And I think at that point we can start to say, okay, I, I trust Muslims, you know. Everyone's capable of, of lying and, and hurting, but you know, that's not what a Muslim is. That's not what Islam is. And I think sort of disassociating all the negative connotations with Islam and what you know Muslims do and who they who we are, you know, can we start to see, okay, what does it mean to be equal? What are the basic human rights? You know, and how can we get those things so that we can Co, you know, coexist, you know, in, in this society. So I really did want to want to add, add, add those few words in there. Thank you. Yeah. And I would like to add that uh, being Muslims, we should also, um, we should also make an effort to uh, follow the norms of the society in a way, maybe you can say the laws of the society. So we uh, recently I have uh, like uh, seen many immigrants not following the road rules and um, these are the basic things and everybody knows that this Hilya Susaika in Finland yeah. is like usually it's nine o'clock in the weekdays yeah. so you cannot just go out play with your kids because it's a hard day and then if somebody comes out of the building condemning that because Muslims should understand they're representing everybody so mm -hmm. each individual 
person is an agent of representing their mm. culture, their deen, their religion. So I feel like if we want equal status in the society, then we should kind of try to follow and respect the norms of the society that we live in. We mm. cannot say like, I'm coming from Pakistan and there's no Hilya Susaika there. So, you know, mm. it's my culture I'm bringing. You can't mm. just, I mean, there's a good and bad side to everything. So we bring the good side of our culture mm. and diversity and not disrespect the society we're trying to integrate into. And now we call home. So, yeah. So I feel like it's the mutual work in process everywhere in all these things that we discussed uh, about all these points. And wrapping this up, thank you girls for doing this today and uh, taking your time out. And it means a lot to me because um, I feel like uh, when we're sitting at a cafe or drawing room talk, like we have so much to talk about these topics, but when it's time to actually come out on the platform, then we're kind of like really reluctant to. So I would really hope that in the future, more people can join me and bring a voice to this platform that is the CME project, because the uh, bigger part, biggest part of this project is the social media campaign. And I hope we get to, um, give our message as Muslim inshallah. women, inshallah, on a broader level, on in this societal level, uh, on an international level, on European level, inshallah. So, okay. um, and uh, I would like to say to the audience that um, AMAL, RU, is an organization which works for Muslim people. If you have any issues regarding living in Finland, so you could always come visit us. We make an individual appointment. And then Me project is about Muslim women. Uh, and their integration into Finnish society. So uh, feel free to explore this at uh, Amal R. Upistifi. And uh, inshallah, I would be uploading this video on YouTube. So uh, let's see how that goes. So thank you, Fatima. Thank you, Jennifer and Saima. All of you, you stay blessed. And let's stay in contact and discuss inshallah. things in the future. Inshallah. Okay. Take care, sisters. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam.